Okay, is everyone ready to start? Nice and warm, yeah. I feel like such a pimp. <laughs> mm, mm, smack my hose. All right, hold on. All right. Hey, can you guys hear me in the back? <laughs> Is that a yes or a no? No. Can you guys hear me in the back now? No. Okay. All right. You're here at the Hardware and Electronics Q&A panel. My name is Kingpin. This is Java Man. Um, Brian Oblivion is supposed to be here. I'm sure he'll show up late. So if you're at the wrong panel, you can't leave now because we're watching you. This is actually going to be a hard act to follow after CDC, but uh, it's probably going to be a little more boring. But uh, basically what this is is a roundtable discussion um, about hardware and electronics issues, anything, any questions, no questions are stupid. If you have like a flea market something, something you found in the trash, you don't know what it is, hopefully you brought it and we can uh, discuss it and check it out. Uh, the questions don't need to be targeted to one of us. If you just want to ask a general question, go ahead and I'm sure there's someone else in the room that's going to be able to answer it. Um, obviously we don't know everything and it's just a, a good way for everybody to get some discussions in. Um, so before we open this up to questions, what we're going to do is just run through who we are, who, where we come from, and some of the current projects we're working on. So, as I said before, I'm Kingpin. I come from Boston, um, member of Loft Heavy Industries, uh, which is currently the at stake research and development labs. So, I get to research things all day long. Um, what I enjoy doing the most is reverse engineering hardware products. Uh, Mostly hardware security products, any products really, but hardware security products currently are the best things to look at. Uh, there's a lot of problems with them. It's kind of a new field, so there's a lot of um, problems with the developers, and they're not really sure how to implement security in their products. Um, I'm also into portable electronics and microprocessor system design, so basic embedded system type of stuff. Um, something I announced back in 1997 at Beyond Hope, God, three years ago, um, was... I was doing a lot of Palm Pilot development. Um, since then, the, the whole PDA field has caught on a lot, so it's, it's, uh, you know, it's really blown up, and I'm sure half the people in here at least have Palm Pilots. Um, I announced a war dialer that I was working on back then. Didn't have a name. Uh, I just finished it. It's called TBA. Uh, it has a, a bunch of different meanings. You can think of one that you want. Um, what it is is, is basically a, a war dialer, a portable war dialer. Um, Throw it up in a ceiling if, you're, if you want to do a, a, a war dial from somewhere you're not supposed to be. Throw it in a phone can. Palm Pilots are so cheap now, you pay 25 or 50 bucks for one. Put the war dialer in a phone can, walk away. If it gets stolen, who cares? If not, you come back in a week and you have your prefix scanned or whatever. So it's kind of cool. Um, you can either grab it from the Loft website or come up here afterwards and I can beam it to you. Um, there's a few other applications that I'll beam to you as well. If you have a color palm, definitely come see me. I'm not going to talk about what I have, but it's a brand new program. Only works on color palms. It's called Blue Balls. So I'll leave it at that. So some of my current research projects. Um, some of you may have seen an advisory that I recently released on the Aladdin e-token, which is a USB hardware token. Uh, I have one in my pocket, but they're kind of small. You want to display it? There we go. It's a tiny... Tiny uh, a little embedded system um, connects to the USB port of a PC, and what it does basically it's it's meant for authentication. It stores um, private data, credentials, anything you want really, X509 certificates, um, and it's supposed to be this private thing that proves you are who you are. So having this thing, it's it's two-factor authentication. Um, having this thing, a physical device, and knowing the PIN number which protects the data, that's supposed to prove who you are. Unfortunately, it's not exactly that simple. Um, there was a problem with the Aladdin e-token. Uh, the, let's see, actually before I say that, the, these things are, are simple embedded systems. Um, the components on the board are a piece of cake to probe and kind of experiment with, uh, which made it such an easy target. There's not really any kind of tamper 
um, evidence or tamper resistance on these things, so you can open the thing up real easily, clip onto the chips, and do all sorts of experimentation with it. Um, so for the e-token, all the data is protected by one pin number. Uh, it's an eight-byte value. Um, what these guys did, though, is they left a default pin, so a default login uh, string, basically. They left that programmed into the external memory device of every single device. So regardless of what the user sets the pin number to, all you have to do is open the device, read the external memory, uh, move that one default string from its known address, which is always fixed, into the user pin area, and you can log right in uh, with the default password, grab all the private information out of it, um, get everything out of it that, that, uh, that the legitimate user had in there. So that's a big problem. And, um, Look for a, another advisory coming out in about a week on a, uh, a similar product, um, actually a competitor's product, that's also a USB hardware token, and, and they did the same thing. So getting into the, the hardware side of security products, there's a lot of things and there's a lot of um, problems that can be exploited. Uh, but we can also help the vendors by fixing their products and have products that we can actually use and feel good about using. Um, so kind of all this thing was was a Cypress uh, CY7C63000. What that is is just a, a general purpose microprocessor uh, which had USB support on board. Um, there's not that many processors right now that have USB support, so it's kind of easy to target that particular processor and get any kind of uh, information I needed on it and development kits and stuff like that. Um, and then it used an Atmel serial double EEPROM as the external memory, so that's as some people know, it's extremely easy to read those things. There's no uh, protection of any sort. Um, and these guys didn't encrypt any of their data on there. So I could easily just change that pin um, and then access all the data. So that's what I'm working on now. Um, there's a technical white paper that I'm putting out pretty soon. Uh, it describes all of the attacks that we tried on these keys. And some worked, some didn't, uh, both from a hardware electrical point of view and also mechanical attacks and software attacks. So keep your eyes open for that. and. Uh, that's it for me. So, Java man, take it away. Hey, yo, yo, yo. Word. What the? According to these lies that were printed about me, uh, I'm a Philadelphia-based hacker with a background in RF engineering, which is pretty much true. Um, my main area of expertise has uh, traditionally been uh, RF hardware design uh, and drinking, which. If anyone was at the bar last night, I apologize for anything I have said. Um, I know that I was carried back to a room. Yes, I apologize to the people in the room too. I, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, I woke up today, thankfully. And uh, my main area of expertise has been traditionally RF hardware uh, and uh, specifically uh, gigahertz band uh, and uh, SHF uh, hardware design. Uh, particularly amplifiers, uh, along with uh, the actual particulars of uh, sped spectrum systems and uh, things along those lines. Uh, I've moved more into uh, now digital logic design. I'm working on a team to design a very fast, very cheap supercomputer. Uh, I can't give you any details on it because it's owned by the government. And uh, so when we release it, it'll also be sold to the general public as well. Uh, my main areas of interest has been, uh, like I said, traditionally RF communication systems and uh, uh, amateur radio type facets as well, uh, along with digital logic design and digital hardware design. Um, that's about, uh, like I said, if, if we each have topics that we get asked further about, uh, Kingpin with his USB and myself, you could ask me, uh, I've written up a couple little things about uh, why spread spectrum is a little bit more inherently secure than uh, any other communication media, um, along with what it means. Um, and uh, some issues regarding why we don't really have very high data rate uh, DSLs uh, until recently, what, what DSL actually does, why its implementation can be difficult, and why we also don't have very high data rate radio uh, to everyone in a mobile situation or have uh, a very underground digital uh, network, uh, which is what Gorilla.net is starting to set up and, and we're working very hard to and what are some of the issues we're running into with that. So I guess, uh, is Brian Oblivion here? Ryan, hello. All right. Uh, I guess we'll take questions. So. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, definitely. Uh, do we have a microphone in here for people to ask questions? Yeah. 
Yeah? Okay. Hobbit has one. The guy with the tie-dye. Um, <laughs> the other hippie with the tie-dye. Um, yeah, if you have any actual, actually I saw somebody in an ele elevator this morning that had some uh, telephone equipment that we're going to bring here. Um, yeah, stand up, bring it up. If you guys have stuff, you can either stand in line or raise your hand or whatever. It's really informal, so I don't know. I mean, you don't have to just sit there. You can dance or something. And I, if, do we have another camera that we can like zoom in on the stuff and put it up on the, on the non-existent uh, projector screen here? No. That way everybody in the room can see it if, if it's small. No, are we not prepared for that? Okay. So this is a silver box. We can pass this around too when we're done because it, it's kind of uh, weird looking. Uh, there's an interesting connector at the end. Uh, it used to be used for vacuum tube sockets, but you, it's more for power signal, uh, for power lines. So, oh, watch water. Oh, oh, that would suck. Yeah. All right. Um, I don't know if you can see it. There is a socket for what would probably be power supplies, and uh, there's actually a little notch here. It's a circular socket, but it's a little notch. You can only put in the, the power supplies one way. Along with a, with a DB15 connector, uh, the same kind of connector that you have uh, for your joystick or your MIDI, and uh, that's for signaling. Along with a DB25 right here, which my guess would be that's where it probably is already programmed. This is probably a system interface, it's probably a program interface. That's my best guess. Yeah, what, what it looks like from the top, this is uh, made by TSG, who I've never heard of. It's technical service group. Um, this thing's called the Gemini System 2. It, and what it looks like, there's a bunch of configuration stuff on the front. Uh, initial rate for pay station, 5 cents, 10 cents, 20 cents, 40 cents. Polarity of coin relay, coin mechanism type, line type, future enhancements. It looks like it's, it's a device that's actually in the pay phone that, that either, I don't know the, the real name of it, but it, it, will, it will take the money in basically and, and uh, I have no, does anybody know? <laughs> <laughs> One thing that's very interesting about it is that there's a copyright 1995 on the on the circuit board, the circuit pack itself, uh, but the construction techniques are actually very old. Um, we have for about probably about the past uh, at least five years, and probably ten, I think to that ten, we've gone to surface mount technology. All these devices on here are all through hole components. There's no uh, surface mount components on the board. Uh, so my best guess is that the board is probably designed about maybe. Where's the camera? Oh, cool. Uh, that way. No. <laughs> there we go. Right. Oh, look at this. Brian Oblivion has shown up. Yay! You want to come up? We started on time, bro. All right, here we go. Um, and this board, uh, like I said, it, it, it looks like it's using older design techniques. Yeah, yeah, get a picture of that. I don't know if anyone can see it. Um, and there is one empty socket and one socket that has a label on it. Usually whenever someone puts a label on it, then uh, and it's such an EEPROM because there might be a, a little window underneath. Um, I'm going to pass it with Ryan and see what he has to say. Could be could be custom power. Uh, sure. All right. Let's get uh, let's get the uh, next piece of equipment as well up here. Sixty-eight HC eleven. I recognize these come out of. Yeah. Uh, well, no RF protection. This is a tr isolation transformers for the yes. for standard. No, well, no, for probably for in and out telephone lines. 1991. Before the switch. Teletrans. Well, okay. Is this the hard part? Okay. Okay. What? Um. Yeah. So we'll pass this around. If I guess if people. Showing hardware is, is a little harder than I thought. Um, if people, do people have any real questions? Someone mentioned they had a Palm Pilot question. That guy? 
okay, we started getting questions. Did you have a question? Yeah, hold on one second. Uh, you mentioned uh, you developed for uh, PDAs. Uh, do you develop anything for Newton? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, sorry. Yeah, next. No, um, not at all. <laughs> All right, well, I was actually waiting for this question. Um, dead serious. Um, so let's talk about, we'll talk about CDMA specifically. Uh, CDMA is a spread spectrum, excuse me? Oh, the re okay, re the question was how uh, sensitive is current cellular technology to jamming, specifically wideband jamming? Okay. The question was how, um, how vulnerable are systems to jamming? Uh, so let's take CDMA for example. CDMA is a nice test case, uh, or a nice specific case, because it's uh, really our only true spread spectrum uh, cellular protocol out there right now. Uh, what spread spectrum means is you have your incoming, well let's say we have a two level, for a very simplified version, a uh, minus five volt signal and plus five volt signal. So it's negative one, or you hit zero and one, okay? And you send that into a mixer along with a pseudo random code. Uh, which has a frequency rate much higher of that than your incoming data rate. What happens is if you look at the power spectral density, it's so much easier if I had an overhead or a whiteboard or some shit like that. If you look at the power spectral density of your regular signal before spreading, you'll see a single spike come up and some humps over this side uh, due to the, uh, the variable frequency nature and the square wave nature of the actual data rate. When you look at spread spectrum, your power spectral density is dumped much further out uh, at a, a specific ratio to the property of that modulation format. Direct sequ specifically direct sequence spread spectrum, which is CDMA. Um, and what happens as a result is that if you want to, if you look at the signal on a scope, if the uh, actual, the, the frequency rate of the spreading sequence is much greater than of the actual data sequence, you will just see noise in the scope. And mathematically, importantly mathematically, your signal is, actually is very similar to noise. If you take an autocorrelation of your signal space uh, with itself, or autocorrelation means with itself, you take the correlation of it, uh, what it actually looks like is it's very, very, very narrow uh, actual correlation area, which, sign, which is a sign that uh, it's very much closer to noise than, than a normal signal. A normal signal's autocorrelation with itself is just one spike at, at uh, tau equals zero. What this means though, okay, is that unless you have the exact PN sequence on the other end, you will never be able to get back, recover your original signal. The PN sequences are designed to be completely orthogonal with each other. So that if you try to generate another sequence that's not exactly the same uh, 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 number of convolutions, or exact, not exactly the same convolutions at each, uh, what they call chip, um, at the same as each uh, data bit, you're never gonna be able to recover your original signal. Now, what's interesting, if you try jamming a standard uh, spread spectrum system with a single tone, uh, a narrow frequency tone, like you, let's say you want to jam someone on walkie-talkie, you key up on their exact frequency using the same modulation format with a little bit more power. Because of the way spread spectrum works, that jammed, jamming signal is, is spread itself while the rest of the signal is despread. So if you actually look at the power spectral density after the mixer, which despreads de your, sig uh, your uh, signal, you will see your original signal and your interferer is very broadband. All right, so, why, so narrow band, the actual uh, single spike or uh, narrow band jamming is very difficult. Wide band jamming is uh, almost impractical because of the power considerations. You have to generate, you know, if you integrate over that, that entire area, that's the amount of you know, power you have to be able to dump into an antenna. Or narrow power you have to be able to generate from power transistors. And when we're getting up to two gigahertz, you can use like Klystrons or, or power transistors, but the, the power considerations are, Excuse me? Spark gaps. Yeah, spark gaps. <laughs> but, but the only problem is that, again, it's, you're not going to be able to get the power you need to do it. Um, an interesting point that was brought up uh, kind of recently, uh, someone uh, had this thing, it, was, it made suck dot, um, about the idea of uh, jamming a satellite. Uh, and the way it worked was by jamming a large, uh, a single uh, frequency power spike. And what it did was desense the front end of the receiver. I want to explain what that means and why this is actually important and why, uh, why people are doing this now. Um, 
basically our front end amplifiers and our receivers have very narrow dynamic range uh, a lot of times. If it's a low noise amplifier or narrow in response in respect to the jammer. And when you generate a very large um, single frequency, very narrow uh, bandwidth signal, very high power, um, it forces the front end amplifier in what's called uh, 1 dB compression, or it forces it into compression. And what happens is that the gain of that amplifier is reduced. So the original signal you're trying to receive actually gets dumped, it gets pushed further and further into the noise floor. So it actually is possible by generating enough power, you can exploit the, uh, the properties of, of receiver technology and, and therefore effectively jam a, uh, a spread spectrum signal. But the, probably the best way to do something like this would be a very uh, narrow beam width antenna uh, point somewhere close to receiver uh, with a local area receiver to, to, to completely deafen the receiver. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All, right. <laughs> All right, hold on. Next. Next. Uh, um. Hey, we got Mike. Mike? Oh. Since I've got the mic, I'll go ahead and ask my question. All right. Uh, Kingpin, what, uh, you still doing much work with Poxag, and what's your favorite way to do Poxag decoding now? Oh man, I was hoping you wouldn't ask that question. Um, no, I haven't done anything with Poxag since, um, we ran out of the, the loft Poxag kits back in, what, 98, 97 or something. Um, I kind of gave up on Poxag. I thought Flex was going to kind of come in and take it away. Uh, probably... I don't really have a favorite method now, but if I were to do it again, I'd probably use maybe like a, a PIC processor, um, have a portable POXAG decoder and just write some software with the PIC, maybe external circuitry if I need it, um, to have a, an actual portable POXAG decoder, maybe hook it up to, uh, to a pager, so take the, the discriminator output from the pager or the actual unfiltered um, signal from the pager into this whatever circuit. Uh, but I, would, I probably wouldn't do it with a laptop or anything. Maybe with a Palm Pilot. Have circuitry and just have a serial input into the Palm Pilot or something like that. Oh, go, go ahead. Do you want to, I can, oh. uh, This is to anybody. Uh, did anybody uh, do anything with the Virgin Connect? What? The Virgin Connect appliance? No. Spell it. Virgin Connect. Vir no. Has anybody heard of that here? Yeah, do you want to you explain what it is? Oh, does anybody know and wants to explain what it is? Virgin Connect. It's a net appliance. It's one of those net appliance things. Yeah, I heard virgins in there somewhere. So it's a, oh, okay, so it's a net appliance like the eye opener. Yeah. Okay, it uses a, a Cyrix chipset. With, uh, what do you say, IDE? Yeah, uh, IDE, and PCMCI. But okay. uh, we're trying to figure out if we can make it like the eye opener, make it into a real computer. Uh, I'm sure it's possible. Go ahead. I was going to say, it, the, the cost of actual manufacturer of a complete proprietary system is so extremely high that no one does it. So it's all based off of the shelf technologies. Uh, additionally, the cost of doing anything that would obfuscate something would add so much, would add more time to the actual production costs and the actual design costs. Uh, no one ever does this, you know, or very rarely do it. Now, I mean, they did with the eye opener where they just put some epoxy on it, you know what I mean? And that was their idea of obfuscation or, you know, flipping a pins over. But the pins on the ID controller are probably being flipped over, which is probably something that was convenient for them uh, when they're actually manufacturing the board. So I think it would be pretty easy for you to do. Yeah, definitely. Another point with the manufacturing cost is the manufacturers of these boards need to be able to test them. Um, and I'm sure they're not going to want to develop their whole test fixtures just to, you know, for this one cheap proprietary product. So it's probably just, a, from my understanding, the eye opener was just standard motherboard and stuff obfuscated with epoxy, covered in epoxy or whatever. Um, so I'm pretty sure that would be the same. If, if you know where to buy them, I'm sure other people would want to know. From the Virgin website. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can guess that one. You'll probably come up with some other fun sites at the same time. Um, there's a question over here. I was just wondering if you've messed around with and compared the visor hardware to the actual Palm hardware because I've noticed that the visor running with the same OS runs a hell of a lot faster than the Palm does and everything. So I'm just wondering what you've done with that. 
That's a good question. There's um, the visor is a, a new PDA that's made by Handspring, which is actually a company formed by Jeff Hawkins, um, who's the founder of um, Palm Computing or, or the pilot back in the day. Uh, there's one here. It looks strikingly similar to the Palm Pilot. It's actually bigger and uh, a little more bulky. Um, what the handspring is, is basically, it's, it's a standard Palm Pilot, but it's made by this other company. Uh, it runs um, a ROM version of Palm OS 3.3. Uh, most of the Palm Pilots now have flash ROMs, so you can upgrade the software. These visors are stuck at OS 3.3 currently. Um, their hardware, their board design is different, uh, but it operates just the same. I think the visors have, um, so the Palm Pilots and the, the Palm up to the Palm 3 run on the Dragon Ball uh, 68328. It's a Motorola processor. It's a 68000 compatible. Um, I think from the 3 to the, or from above the 3 to maybe like the 7, they use the Dragon Ball EZ processor, which is just a, an enhancement of that. It kind of takes away some of the unused functionality uh, of the 68328, and it's a little cheaper. Um, it's also a little bit faster. And I think that's what the visor uses. Now there's also a 68328VZ, which just came out, and I'm not sure if it's in any devices yet. Possibly the uh, Palm 3C, which is the color version. That the the uh, the VZ is has has a PLL for for up getting up to 33 megahertz as a system clock, which is um, basically twice as fast as the Palm Pilots were or 16.7 megahertz. Okay, so the the Palm 3C is comparable in speed to the visor, I've just been told. Um, but basically everything that runs on the uh, Palm OS platform from version 3.3 is going to run on any, any Palm OS platform. The good thing about the Handspring device, if you go to handspring.com, uh, they have an expansion port in the back, which is totally hackable. Uh, what it is, is is a bunch of direct connects to some of the um, I.O. ports and some of the, the port circuitry and pins on the Dragon Ball. Uh, which makes it nice. The original Palm Pilots only had a serial port, and there's only so much you could do with the serial port uh, without having external circuitry. Here comes some CDC stickers, I think. Thanks, Death Veggie. Feel free to come up here and answer some questions with us. Um, so this, this springboard module, they call it, is this expansion port on the handspring, on the visors, and uh, it's it's amazing. Um, there's a bunch of white papers up on Handspring site. You can make uh, custom circuit boards um, to basically do whatever you want. I think they have an MP3 player currently out. They have a camera, um, basic consumer applications, but you could basically do whatever you want with it. Um, they also have some that just have uh, Flash on board, so you can write software and kind of distribute it like a cartridge, um, which I'm not sure really why you'd want to do that, because it's going to cost a lot of money. Um, but definitely take a look at, at the handspring device if you wanted to do any kind of hardware modifications. And also, actually, on that note, the Palm 3X, I believe, made by... Pay attention to the man over here. Yeah, save one for me. Um, the Palm 3X also has an expansion port, but it's not really defined as well as the uh, springboard module. All right, wait. Wait, you can't just throw them out. You guys got to do something cool. All right? Why don't you, uh, how about for really good questions or if you dance or like pop your eyeballs out or something? Where's the guy that was rapping at the, uh, at the movie last night? I want to see him and he'll get a shirt. What's that? Do you have a, do you have a Newton story to share? Yeah. You'll what? You won't sing? If you do sing, can we give you one? But he'll get a shirt. All right, what do I say? Whatever you want. Here, where's the mic? <laughs> oh. Hey, I uh, had a question to ask about. Um, <laughs> do you guys uh, mess around with the uh, microchip pick controllers? I mean, microchip as in the oh. game. Yes. Oh, yeah. Those. Um, do you want to? Do you want to talk about this? Mike. Okay. Microchip is a is a company that makes. Um, a bunch of different integrated circuit circuits. Uh, their PIC processor is a general purpose processor. Um, they're really cheap. They're available everywhere. Um, yeah, we haven't forgotten about the shirts. We just, you just have to pay attention now. It's like school. <laughs> yeah, right. If you stay quiet, then you get a shirt. 
Um, yeah, so, so the PIC processors are, are really cheap. You can get them um, from DigiKey, uh, digikey.com. Um, basically, any electronic store. I've done uh, a lot of development with them, mostly for like art projects. So I have things that I'll use a multicolor LED and like change the color of the LED every minute and just do some stupid art stuff with it. Um, they're really easy to program. They have development kits that are like maybe 20 bucks, 29 bucks. So it's something that, that students can use and it's affordable enough. Well, the reason why I was asking is um, I do a development on the, uh, you know, the 16 C84 or F84 one yep. that has a flash memory. Yep. Uh, the reason why I picked that one is, you know, because not as a flash memory, I mean, it only takes like a couple of dollars worth of parts to build a serial interface, and then the software and stuff is free. Um, do you know if uh, Microchip or like Atmel, I think it's another company that makes processors, assuming I'm pronouncing the name correctly, um, do you know if they're going to start turning all into flash memory and get away from that OTP thing? Um, no. They, I don't think they're ever going to go away totally from OTP. Um, the, it, yeah, it depends on the application if you actually want flash, and it's also developing uh, integrated circuits with flash technology is still more expensive than OTP. Um, and if you're not going to want to reprogram your system, uh, you, you'd have an OTP part. What people usually do is they do development with a flash part so they can keep on reprogramming their firmware as they're doing development. And then when they go into production, they just get a ROM version, um, have microchip program it at their manufacturing plant, send them to the vendor who's manufacturing with that already programmed. Okay, well, what I was going to mention about is Microchip, they also make you know, the UV version of pretty much every one of their OTP processors, but right. what sucks about using the UV process is there's like, for me, it's like a 10 to 20 minute turnaround time, whereas the flash thing with my two, $2 programmer, I can turn around as short as three seconds. Yeah, yeah, uh, they do have the UV parts, which you erase with UV light, as the name would imply. Um, it, it does take like 10 or 20 minutes. I, I don't know how much those are going to go away. Um, I, I'm sure people are still going to use them, but Flash is definitely more convenient for development and also if you want to do firmware upgrades on your product. Anything okay. else? I mean, it, do, you have a, do you have a specific question about that? I mean, using Flash, yeah, I mean, it really depends on your I, product. I, I think it's also important to mention that uh, there's, there's, companies don't do things without a reason usually. Uh, such an electronics company, so it could be more more expensive. Well, I mean, when it comes to like when, when production means real money, there's a, they do things for reasons, and it could be that they might have like higher failure uh, failures in production of uh, flash memory. It might be harder for them to actually manufacture, and also for a lot of applications, they never reprogram things. You know, like chips in uh, in uh, analog brake systems, uh, for example. Uh, it's very rare that they'll ever reprogram the chip in in production. They might just yank the entire board. Okay. Well, I was just thinking, you know, like, okay, the OTP is cheaper, but, you know, as an option of, you know, permanent once you have your code developed. But, you know, for me, when I'm doing development, it's nice to be able to, you know, reprogram it, you know, get the bugs and stuff out of it, and be able to do it fast. But that's why you would use flash RAM if you had to reprogram. If you, if you went to a situation where you were making a million of them, even just use one time programming because you'd never reprogram if you had a million units. Uh -huh. Use the Atmel 8535. The Atmel 8535 is what? It's a chip that we're bringing out now. We've got 512K of data and I think 8K of flash. Okay, 512K of, of RAM? Uh, it's either 512K or 512 byte. Okay, either 512K or 512. 8K of flash and 512 bytes of RAM. Okay. And that's a general, that's another general purpose type of processor? Yeah, uh, we use them at work. So. Cool. And that's Atmel, atmel.com. Do you know what you said? What, what's the, uh, the programming interface he wants to know? A lot, a lot of the, a lot of the chips that have uh, flash are are definitely uh, serial protocols. Some of them are standards, like. Um, oh, no, they are, they are serial. But, uh, I don't yeah, it's def, it's going to be serial for the most part. Um, and whatever it is, it's e you, it, 
there's data sheets that would provide that information on the timing so you could either build a development system yourself or just use one, but it's going to be standard serial. There's a combination of like two or three pins that enables you to program it, and once you set those up, then you can just pretty much send serial data in. There's an actual uh, protocol for it, but it's in the uh, Atmel data sheet on atmel.com. Uh, can you pass the mic over to this guy in the blue shirt? I'll also like to mention, uh, I've been working on some stuff like uh, DOP or RDF, if anyone has any questions about that. Well, my question is for uh, Brian Oblivion. Could you just maybe stand up and uh, tell us what you've been working on lately, what you've been playing around with? I think we're all curious. Yeah. Let's hear it. I want a shirt. Well, I, I mainly uh, come from a cryptographic accelerator, a cryptographic coprocessor for Rena. Um, I worked on the uh, uh, a, a key management device, I'll say, at a uh, government contractor. And I'm trying to take that information that I learned there and trying to put it into like, the uh, public sourced uh, arena. Um, we're kind of doing a little side work with Peter Gutman in um, uh, where is he, uh, Australia and uh, Auckland. And um, he's going to be releasing a paper on um, uh, uh, open source cryptographic processors that uh, you just stick on your machine when you do operations, and when you're done with it, just pop it off, throw it in your pocket, walk away. It's the, the idea is to keep the keys off the system. Um, right now, every OS is like completely open, and you can, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of papers on um, key searching and um, finding keys off of hard drive images and stuff. So we want to um, move the stuff off of the hard drives into some type of IC or into some type of um, uh, token you can walk away with, like the I button, or uh, even some type of uh, prom-based key, like a data key or something. Um, aside from that, I'm still working on GorillaNet. Uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's like herding cats, trying to get people to get up and buy the equipment that's necessary. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's difficult because nobody wants to play around with 1,200 or 2,400 baht uh, data links. They want to do 10 meg and higher, or at least 1.2 meg and higher. And you really need line of sight for most of that. So it's very frustrating when you can't find uh, uh, prime real estate now that the cellular and every other kind of wireless thing is taken off. Um, so that, that's basically what I'm working on, working on now. So if you have any questions, particularly to that, I'll have to answer them. All right, where's the mic closest to? Um, without knowing exactly what it does, that sounds a little strange. Um, do, do you know what, what type of low-level stuff he, he did? Yeah, he was trying to do something with the IR, so we need to uh, uh, get a response back from the other one before it was sent, so we're just doing like a blind send. So um, if, now, now, I actually did uh, another, I, did, I designed a medical device based around the 68328 um, that actually used infrared. Uh, and, and if the, all the infrared port is on the Dragon Ball is just a UART um, and the infrared it just has data output at a 3 16th bit rate which is something that the infrared transceivers are going to use um, by doing if that's really what he did I wouldn't see how that would actually damage anything other than maybe maybe crash the OS or something which you could just reset um, but I don't think it would damage the hardware because it's just going to I mean it's just going to draw power he did this uh, to two or three units and uh, eventually three comp one of them and says what the hell are you doing because he's trying to get around the OS Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless he clobbered the flash RAM job or the flash ROM, but I, I don't know. If you have a web page, do you know? Do you know URL offhand? Uh, I can get you his email address. Okay. What? Well, you can email it to me, and if if anyone else is interested, send me mail, um, kingpin at loft com, and I'll forward it on. But that's that would be interesting to know. All right. There's more questions. A uh, two-fold question regarding uh, modems um, and uh, basically uh, identifying um, uh, how a particular uh, protocol is implemented. Like, uh, if you're doing, uh, let's say, a war dialing uh, an exchange, a lot of times they'll come up with uh, 
numbers and still respond to any you know, combination of key inputs. Uh, you know, how would you go about uh, you know, finding you know, what kind of computer this is when it doesn't respond? We, yeah, I think we, we'll each say something on this. Um, a lot of times it, when I've been word dialing, uh, there are a lot of systems that don't come up with anything. Um, it, it could really be any type of device, and it, you know, not, not every device hooked up to a modem is going to have an identification string. Um, it might have some, it might be expecting some weird control characters to turn it on. I'm not sure there's one generic way to identify any one system. Um, and if it doesn't identify itself in some way, it's, you know, it's basically impossible to know unless you actually get into their site somehow and, and see what it's connected uh, to. I have a craft uh, access terminal at home. Uh, it's used by a uh, phone company. Uh, uh, line technicians to uh, you know, check up on customers on the line. Uh, you know, they have a lot of things that they have in there. It's like a 300 or 1200 baud modem. Yeah. It seems like the specification is proprietary because you know, if I try and connect using uh, a regular PC, I can't you know, talk with a remote computer, but with the craft access terminal, Actually, my, my understanding of the craft terminals were they were they just had like um, macros basically. So it was still you connect 300 baud or 1200 baud or whatever the craft terminal was. The craft terminal is this big yellow uh, lineman handset with a display and everything. It's like a, a fancy. Do we have one? All right, someone has one I guess on, on the other side. But if they can wave it around, that would be cool. Um, yeah, my understanding is that they just used uh, macros. So if anything, it's just going to be you know strings of control characters or something. So maybe if you can m monitor what those are, maybe with like an RS-232 analyzer or not not RS-232. Um, so I guess something hooked up to the phone line. If you can analyze those strings, then you might be able to to recreate that with a terminal program. So you're saying I should like record the signal as it goes over my phone line and then like type back into an oscilloscope or something? Uh, it, um, uh, if you're ambitious enough. <laughs> I was going to say, if you really want to be a, a hard ass about it, what, um, but seriously what I'll do is, uh, don't, you, you have to get yourself an oscilloscope if you have a really good one at your sound card. Um, uh, because think about it, your data rate on your phone line can, oh, holy no, shit. No, th this actually is, this isn't a crap terminal, but it, it's something cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway. <laughs> I'll yeah, right. a t-shirt for one of these. Yeah. <laughs> uh, two t-shirts. Right. Um, you got to remember, oh, let's hold this up first. It, it says, ooh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it, it looks like some kind of um, like mo phone. mobile thing. Um, <laughs> it looks like it's either a terminal. They, uh, um, a lot of like uh, UPS type companies use these things. Um, for keeping track of their location and kind of message message tracking, cool. and it probably a, also serves as a portable terminal, which would be kind of cool. If you have an acoustic coupler and hook it up to a payphone or something like that. All right. Um, yeah, you remember your data rate coming down your the actual uh, sorry not data rate your simple rate excuse me your simple rate on your modem line never really exceeds what four kilo, uh, four kilohertz. Excuse me? The symbol rate is 4 kilohertz. No, the sample rate is 8 kilohertz. The sim symbol, not sample, symbol. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, because of Nyquist, you have, to si you have to sample at double the symbol rate. Okay. Your symbol rate, your bandwidth of your, your signal coming down line cannot exceed 4 kilohertz. And trying to remember, it's either half or double your data rate, uh, is your, is your symbol bandwidth. But your sim, when we were talking about modems, um, they don't do uh, really uh, binary modulation schemes anymore, where you know uh, one level means high, or this tone means one, or this tone means zero. Uh, the, the idea of the four level FSK decoder is that you have four different tones. What this is called is MRE uh, signaling. The idea that uh, you have two to the n possible um, Yes, to the impossible symbols, and each uh, symbol encodes n bits. So, for example, uh, it's, it's a great saving on bandwidth, but you lose, uh, you take your engineering hit because you're, it's a less power efficient scheme. Uh, you need more power to trip. Oh. I guess we're done. Thanks, See yeah. You later. <laughs> yeah um, um, okay. Um,
the re what happens is that you actually need more power to transmit to uh, get your bit error rate to be the same. Because when you have your when you have multiple symbols like that, you have like n sim uh, m symbols, let's say 16 symbols, your amount of gap in between your symbols uh, decreases. Uh, and in standard noise channels, there's a higher probability of getting bit errors. So uh, when you when you get closer and closer symbol spacing, than what they call the constellation, you really want to be ballsy. What you do is you you sample off your uh, your phone line into your sound card, and you can just display on your screen. You got to remember, your sound card can sample up at 41, 44.1 kilohertz, I believe. Um, a lot of sound cards, I mean, it might be just some specialty cards that can sample higher. Or if you want to real, be a real badass, what I was thinking about doing, and this is pretty cool, this is a hook up a pick to a USB chip and just have the pick run sampling and dump the values down the USB system because USB is a lot faster than anything else you really have easy access to in your system. And then these little USB, these uh, easy connectivity USB ports are like 60 bucks. And you have like, you know, headers out and you just head them out to like a pick. He's not a good set. And uh, That'd be cool. you have a sample and then stuff it down the line. And you get sample possibly uh, like, I don't know, maybe like one megahertz or something like that, or uh, possibly higher. So you, get, you do even crazier uh, schemes. I got a quick question for Brian over there. Yeah. Uh, I was curious to know that you're working on a lot of crypto hardware currently, and I've been doing some stuff for a soon to be former employer with Rainbow, uh, Rainbow Technologies Crypto Swift card. Yeah. And uh, I was basically wondering, uh, first of all, what are your opinions on it if you've worked with it at all? Um, the Crypto Swift, which chip does it use? The fast man? Yeah, I believe so. Well, unfortunately, I'm bound by NDA, so I can't really talk. <laughs> ah, right, yeah. Uh, I was almost coming But I, I, can, I, I can tell you that there is no on-chip key storage, so the keys are lying on the card somewhere if you have physical access to the device. There were, there were two cards that I know of. One of them did 200 transactions per second, and one of them did 600. The 200 transaction per second was built in a fault kind of uh, tolerant method. It had a black box construction, so that it was tampered with hardware. The other one was just an open, and because of the heat differential, I assume it could do more transactions per second. I have the 600 transactions per second. And my basic question is, is that uh, the software that they provide beyond the SDK is more or less geared towards doing Apache uh, web server transactions, SET transactions, SSL, all nine yards. And basically, I was developing drivers at one point for OpenBSD 2.7 because they had worked with the high end cards. And I wanted to see if I could offload just the general libraries onto the CryptoSwift card. And I couldn't, there were things that seemed to be from Rainbow that were getting in my way that I couldn't get around somehow in terms of access to the direct hardware. I was wondering if you know anything about it or any hints or anything. That, that's not a good sign. Well, I mean, I really hate when crypto companies do this stuff because it, it bounds our hands and I, I cannot afford a legal lawsuit. Right, okay. I, I really think we need to like just start pounding on their doors to release this information because if the design is worth any salt whatsoever, they should right. be able to release public data sheets on how to use the card. I mean, Definitely. if it's done right, no secrets will leak out of it just because you know how the card works. Well, that was the thing I was wondering is that it got me onto thinking the more conspiracy theory aspects of what are the chances that these people are caching keys or storing information that shouldn't be on the card in some area that you never have access to. I mean, not that they can conceivably do anything with it without doing some very high level kind of network transaction in the whole nine yards, but. I mean, the whole thing with crypto accelerators is um, you you back end all the cryptographic processes so stuff isn't lying all over the uh, all over the stack and not being right. paged to disk. So. What, what they provide is a level of, um, of security where a remote attacker can't really uh, uh, directly address registers and, and key storage devices that you may have hanging off of that chip because uh, when you use any type of accelerator, as you know, you just send a request, right, it right. does the, the function and pieces you back. Right, the, 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 the uh, process doesn't need to know what the key is, it just says use this key in this register, it doesn't know the actual contents of it, and then right. you get the results. So that, that's, that's where they're, I guess that, that, that's the functionality they provide, but it's, as you know, there's there's no real added physical level of security. The only other question with, with the rainbow stuff. Yeah, the rainbow stuff. Uh, the only other question I have is for uh, rainbow's uh, USB I key tools. Have you seen that at all? Uh, uh, Kingpin has. I can't comment on that. Oh right. But wait a week. I got gotcha. you. I'll talk to you after <laughs> this. <laughs> if you guys were listening earlier, you'll understand that. So, wait a week and check the webpage. That's, Let's pass it around a little bit more. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question yet? Or over there. Uh, I just wanted to know if you knew about any good sites for, it's not over. Any good sites for some Palm hardware that's not coming right from Palm companies? <coughs> like, I heard about some stuff like decoders for key cards and stuff like that. 
Um, for Palm hardware, I don't know any offhand, but if you go to palmgear.com, um, that, it's mostly like a software site, third-party application site, but um, they also have like a news section there where people will announce their hardware products and stuff. So go there as the starting point and you'll probably be able to find, you know, there's, there's basically guys working in their uh, garage making hardware devices for the Palm, so, so go there first. Any, any other? Yeah, there's a few, okay. I don't know, does anyone know how much time we have left? We need to save time to give out the shirts, right? Okay, really quick two part question. Uh, first of all, if I have an AC uh, signal coming in between uh, 0.5 hertz and 35 hertz, probably between two and 200 microvolts, um, I'm getting a lot of noise with the signal, probably from induction, and I've tried filtering, uh, like a high pass and a low pass filter, everything above and below that, but I'm still getting some noise in the actual bandwidth. Um, do you guys suggest any uh, noise canceling techniques? Uh, are you doing the sinusoid? Is, uh, yes. It's, it's purely sinusoidal. Yes, it is. And what kind of noise, what does the noise look like? Like in the shot noise, or is it uh, digital? Is it? Is this your board, or is this like a device? Oh, no, this board? is mine. This is your, uh, how, how are you routing the uh, power signals? Are they going by like any clock oscillators or anything? Or? Um, right now, I'm just using a function generator to create the signals, and it's, uh, it's uh, like I said, a side wave for now. I'm eventually going to mess around with EEG. Is, is, is it a multi level board or just double sided? Oh, just, just yeah. double sided. But um, I think probably uh, because of the wires and everything else that I have running all over the place, there might be some kind of weird induction thing going on. Uh, at, at 35 hertz, I mean, you're talking really low signal. That, that, that it's really, really slow, and uh, you're not going to have to worry too much about. I mean, you're going, you're looking at lumped element models for all your systems rather than uh, distributed transmission line models. Um, and what I mean, what exactly? Do, I mean, are you sure you're not picking up your noise from uh, uh, from your actual yeah, or but not that from your actual instrumentation that's reading this. I mean, I mean, I, I really can't think of it. Have you looked at? Have you used different instrumentation and verified that? All right, because when you're dealing with down at 35 hertz, 200 and and uh, what is it, 200 millivolt peak to peak or something like that? Two to 200. All right, so you, you really should be able to just uh, tack on a simple RC filter. Uh, I mean, you're not going. I mean, at your lowest frequency, uh, what'd you say it was five kilohertz, uh, five hertz, point five. five hertz, and your highest frequency was 35. Um, you're talking about like a rather large end to end bandwidth. I mean, it's so you got. You're not gonna like if you have a signal coming in with 0.5 hertz and has frequency components on top of it, at like 5 hertz, 10 hertz, 20 hertz. You're not gonna be able to go and like notch those out. Otherwise, you're gonna affect your passband. Um, I mean, you could you could build a uh, a multiple pole uh, RC filter. Or, hell, build something up with an op amp. You could build up build up a good like op amp. Um, but, common or something. We'll, we'll take this offline. Okay. And, uh, uh, we, we gotta do a last question. We'll, we can talk to you later. I mean, okay. we're we're not like going out and yeah. disappearing. Oh, my second question was just if I can get a shirt if I make a really really bizarre and annoying and scary noise. Yes. All right. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll give you a shirt if you shut up. <laughs> we got one more after this. Okay. Uh oh, we have one more shirt, and there's the guy that did the rap at the movie is over here, so we're gonna have some competition. Um, let's take one more really quick question. If there even are, oh, there's a hand way back there, okay. Can someone, can someone give that guy a mic who's about to stand up? I wonder if you've done any uh, decoding of flex or, or reflex? No comment. Yeah. <laughs> Java Man has no comment, um, I haven't. But there's actually um, an IC made by, I want to say Motorola, um, that's an actual flex decoding IC. So I don't know the number offhand, but if you could go to their Motorola site and check out their radio ICs, um, you might be able to, to build up some kind of flex decoding circuitry pretty easily. Um, it is going to need a, a host processor, so you could use a PIC or, or whatever you want um, to do that, but I haven't personally, no. Okay, so we have one more shirt. How many people want shirts? Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, do you even know what shirts these are? <laughs> okay, see, these are PumpCon 99 shirts, and this is like the last of the batch. But you can get a new one if you're invited to PumpCon this year. So. Okay, how about this? All right. 
I want this guy to, to do his beatbox. Right, if, someone else, if someone else comes up here and raps along with his beatbox, then we'll send, we'll send somebody another. All right, Java Man, are you going to have more shirts? This year? Yeah. We'll, we'll send somebody a shirt, either a loft shirt or, or something that we can find, maybe like a CDC shirt or something, HNN shirt, um, if someone has the balls to come up here and rap. Oh, yeah, we have two left. Okay, come on. Someone, I thought you wanted shirts. Mogul, are you here? Mogul? Mogul? I know Mogul can like, uh, like freestyle pretty cool. So, uh, does anyone can freestyle? They, I, you, guys, you guys must not want shirts too bad. Yeah. Okay. Well, then we'll save a shirt. So, why don't you do like 10 seconds of your shit? Because I was funny as hell. <laughs> Both. Oh my say. god. <laughs> All right, that guy gets a shirt. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so I, I don't know if we're out of time or not. If, okay, well, we're out of time. So if you guys have more questions, come up. Thanks a lot for coming and come up here and get our, our software. Let me beam you some stuff. And we have one more shirt, I think. So, yeah, we got more shirts. so come up or something. Thanks a lot, you guys. <laughs>